Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, our new workshop series. Uh, well, we, those who have been here uh, for longer know that we do every year a workshop series of five or six workshops. Uh, last year, we dealt with the subject of resilient energy infrastructures and had a different uh, viewpoints, perspectives on, on the challenges, basic challenges to energy infrastructures, be it from cyber terrorism or from terrorist activities, or the natural catastrophes and so on, uh, which was extremely interesting. This year we will discuss in a workshop series uh, the question of changing energy flows. Uh, in the world uh, of today and the future. We are very happy as users uh, that we have again two very distinguished partners with whom we run these workshop series. This is like the last two years, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Uh, Mr. Blomeyer represents them here as the head of the Adenauer Foundation in London and will also soon address you, uh, and with the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a London-based think tank initiated by Lord Weidenfeld and uh, Sasha Havlicek, who is running that institute, uh, will also join us later. She's, she's late, she has a board meeting today, and now uh, here is Owen Graham, who, uh, and, and Hella Pick, who represents the institute, uh, which is a fine institution, and we're, we're happy to have both partners, and with both partners we discussed uh, this workshop series, and what, what, what will be the subjects. We will have five workshops, uh, the first on, well, obviously, Turkey and Mediterranean gas, what does it mean for Europe and the world? Then we will deal with uh, the shale revolution in the United States and its implications for, for all of us. Then we will deal with uh, Iraq and Kurdistan, uh, the new oil and gas that's coming from there, looking for new markets, finding its way out with the help of Turkey as, as far as it seems right now. And then we will uh, look to Iran uh, is there a reintegration in global energy markets? If so, that would change the world dramatically. And we see that there are a lot of signs right now. I have just been there together with Arash Duro, our research associate at an energy conference in Kish Island. And we had the clear impression that, uh, well, there, there is a, a wind of change. Uh, in Iran, and that uh, at least the new government, the Rouhani approach, uh, remains, uh, deserves to be tested. Uh, it's not clear yet whether it will succeed. There are hardliners who are fighting it. Some people might say this is all cosmetics. Uh, we believe that uh, at least this approach should have a fair chance, and uh, if that would happen, of course, it would change the situation dramatically as uh, Iran is the, by far uh, the strongest uh, holder of energy reserves if you take together uh, oil and gas. And then we will discuss China's energy hunger. How does that affect the world? Uh, and, uh, and we see this, uh, well, assertiveness of China whenever energy is in discussion. And we will discuss that uh, with the, also with Chinese participants. Today's workshop is just the preparation of another workshop that we will have outside that series. I, I mean, I hope that the Adenauer Foundation and uh, uh, ISD will, will also participate. What, we discussed it with Amit Moore, whom, whom you see here. Um, 
uh, and the uh, uh, Atlantic Council of the United States, who will be a partner for that. We will have a workshop in September in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, discussing these matters, what does Mediterranean gas means for the region, for Israel, for Jordan, uh, perhaps for Egypt, but definitely for Turkey and Cyprus. So uh, take this as a sort of, well, we thought at the beginning this is a small workshop with a few people around the table, but then we felt more and more interest and we are very sorry that we can't make a round table this time. It would have meant to, to tell uh, most of you that it's not possible to participate and that we didn't want. So everybody is welcome here. We have a big panel and that means discipline, a lot of discipline when it comes to the time. So everybody has an introductory a statement for five minutes. If he's not finished or she is not finished at these five minutes, there's one more minute, and then the guillotine will, <coughs> will fall. Uh, so uh, uh, I beg everybody, I know that everybody here in the podium has much more to say than these five minutes, but we want to have different perspectives and we want to have, as usual, here at users time for discussion. Before I start uh, with uh, Ambassador Scheck, I would like to give the floor to Hans Hartwig Blomeyer, who is director of the London office of the Adenauer Foundation, uh, thanking him at the same time for the ongoing partnership with the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. We also have the Konrad Adenauer Fellowship at Users, uh, which we're, we're very happy to have. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, Hans Hartwig, for, for all your support, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Flüger. As you have asked for discipline, I should give the first example, and introductory remarks should be, first of all, short, and I promise uh, that I will stick to that. Uh, because we have this fantastic panel here, I think we should use the time for the discussion about the topic and uh, not too much for introductory remarks. But anyhow, I would like to thank, from my point of view, also Professor Flüger and users for this ongoing cooperation, which I think has been most successful in the, in the last years, and we are absolutely committed to continue on with these uh, issues, and also would like to welcome and thank the Institute for Strategic Dialogue for joining uh, this effort. From our point of view, being a political foundation, these, which seems to be such technical discussions about energy supply, energy demand, have an enormous political implication, and uh, would just uh, point out that what is going on in these days and weeks in Ukraine, when we thought about the countries and the issues we should talk about this year, I think we, we weren't seeing or, or foreseeing what is now on the table, and it, which has, of course, also a, an, an, uh, an, an energy component, but is uh, most of all a very sensible and significant political dimension, which will have enormous impacts on energy supply for the next years, not only for Europe, I think for the world. So, I think uh, if we are going into this direction, if we discuss and if we combine in our discussions the technical implications, but also the political, the geopolitical components, I think we are dealing with most interesting and most important issues. So thank you again very much to you, sirs, Professor Flügel, your team, and obviously to our distinguished panel, which have uh, accepted our invitation to join us here today. And I'm looking forward for it, which I will think will be a most interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Professor thank you. It's now up to you to manage with, with German precision uh, this remarkable challenge of this uh, both in quality and quantity remarkable panel. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I was asked by Carola uh, to hint to this uh, Twitter uh, uh, users mad gas is uh, today's uh, uh, Twitter uh, headline or however you, you call it. So everybody who wants to participate in Twittering, uh, uh, that obviously is necessary today. And, <laughs> and I, I, I support it very much. So everybody who wants to, to be active with that can, can easily do it from here. Well, Ambassador Scheck, uh, I, I will not uh, go 
deeply into his CV because you have it here uh, in your papers, but he's really one of the great veterans of, of the diplomatic service uh, in Israel. And he is uh, a co-founder of the Abnua party, the party of uh, C.P. Livni, today Minister of Justice, former Foreign Minister. So everybody who knows a little bit about Israel knows exactly now how we should, uh, uh, well, well, where he where he stands. But he is a, uh, well, I would say he's a, a great representative of the whole country, and we are we're happy to have you here. Uh, you're teaching diplomacy at Tel Aviv University, or a consultant, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Trüger. Thank you, Mr. Blomayer. Uh, with two German introductions, I would not dare to override my five minutes. Um, so there is this very um, classic uh, Jewish joke about this guy who walks into a shop and says to the man at the counter, uh, good morning, sir, I would like to buy a washing machine. So the shopkeeper says, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but we don't sell washing machines. So the customer says, but I don't understand. There's a large sign outside with a big picture of a washing machine. So the man says, yes, we sell signs. <laughs> that is the only plausible explanation for my presence here. <laughs> because, <laughs> to be quite honest, I am not an expert on energy. I have uh, sort of grown uh, an interest and, uh, and a certain uh, knowledge about this specific issue of Eastern Mediterranean uh, gas through uh, my involvement in the Institute of, uh, for Strategic Dialogue uh, and uh, specifically a task force that has been formed around uh, Turkey. Uh, and we have discussed this thing at length and that is why uh, my interest has grown. But what I do try to bring to the table, both there and here, is a certain uh, experience in diplomacy and specifically in our regional diplomacy. It's clear that the emergence of uh, East Mediterranean gas was a game changer uh, for many in, in the region, uh, not the least uh, for Israel economically, conceptually, this is, uh, this is a, a, a real uh, fundamental and important uh, change. The, uh, Economic repercussions are, are, are clear and may be discussed uh, later. This is not my area. But the question is, is there something beyond the obvious uh, economic repercussions that we should uh, be looking at? Um, in many international situations, conflictual or other, there is often a balance of power or a competition, I don't know exactly how to call it, between uh, interest, uh, including uh, economic interest, but not uh, exclusively uh, economic, and on the other side, uh, political or ideological convictions. And it's, uh, sadly I must say, it's often an un uneven and unbalanced uh, competition because uh, facing the very rational world of interest is a very emotional world of uh, ideology and, and, and convictions who uh, tend to bend uh, much in the, to be much more difficult to bend than the interest. Uh, the Middle East uh, conflict that uh, we are the heart of is uh, unfortunately a very good example for that because uh, uh, if you look at the situation uh, from a cold uh, a rational point of view, uh, clearly the interest in making peace is, uh, is, is so obvious and one day everybody will say, my goodness, why didn't we do this years ago? But still, uh, it has been uh, going on for many, many, uh, many, many years and decades. Um, in our task force we have discussed at length, uh, based on a, on a really excellent uh, paper by John Roberts, who is at the end of this table and who will be speaking uh, later about uh, uh, the fact that uh, connecting uh, the, the gas fields uh, off the Israeli shore to uh, Turkish, uh, uh, thirsty Turkish markets, I must say, makes, uh, makes a, lot of, uh, a lot of sense. Um, however, it is also uh, 
an idea which uh, meets uh, many diverse uh, political barriers on the way, which makes it look, uh, if not unlikely, at least difficult uh, to, to achieve. There's the question of uh, Cyprus, obviously, because uh, whichever route you choose, you will have to either go through Cyprus or, or Cypriot waters or Cypriot Easy or something, and that means that that won't be possible unless uh, something dramatic happens uh, on the on the Cyprus issue between uh, between Turkey and, and Cyprus, um, which uh, on which there is some uh, hope, I must say, in the last uh, in the last uh, few months and weeks, but it's still far away. There's issues concerning Syria and Lebanon. There's issues <coughs> concerning Israel and Turkey, which uh, seems like a childish squabble, but even that uh, turns out to be uh, relatively uh, difficult to uh, to handle. So uh, uh, skepticism is uh, is not unfortunately completely uh, completely um, unreasonable uh, uh, for this uh, for this uh, issue. Um, just a, yeah, just a just a, a word about Israel and Turkey. Uh, we are moving forward. Things are looking better than they uh, than they used to. But since this uh, connecting both uh, through a pipeline is a involves a long term relationship, uh, I think uh, that uh, it might look uh, a bit uh, questionable for many Israelis to rely on such an uh, unstable and unpredictable uh, partner. So, uh, since I have uh, the last minute, I will say uh, the summarizing uh, uh, bottom line, and that is that economic interest alone uh, is probably insufficient uh, to overcome uh, political conflicts. Uh, but since the political conflicts we have uh, touched upon are in a positive dynamics, even if it's a modest one, it may be used as a catalyst. And in some cases, economic interest may be sufficient in order to at least overlook, if not resolve, political barriers. And that is, for example, why uh, there is such a great volume of trade between Israel and Palestine, for example, and why it's not unusual to hear Hebrew spoken in the Gulf states. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we knew why we asked you first. We have the broad picture now. Uh, and I would like to continue with Mehmet Bögütkü, founding chairman and CEO of Global Resource Corporation, but also the founder and president of the Bosporus Energy Club. And at the meeting of this Bosporus Energy Club, we have been meeting in December. Uh, and uh, afterwards, I immediately invited you to come here. And uh, well, Turkey, an unstable partner, I saw you made a note immediately. And uh, perhaps you just uh, take up the ball from, uh, from uh, Ambassador Shek. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to commend you for organizing the series of workshops because through such exercises we will be able to pave the ground for policy makers to have options. Because uh, the issue, energy issue, have always been politicized. We can never treat energy in isolation from geopolitics or domestic political drivers. We know that. But such work be here in Turkey, Israel, Cyprus, are really very useful to give some feedback and options for the policymakers uh, to consider. That's one point. I'll come back uh, to Turkey's uh, being unpredictable uh, or uncertain or unstable. But before that, if you allow me, I would like to give also a little bit broader picture in my five minutes. I have five points to make. If I exceed, you will, I'm sure, remind me. One is that I think this region is also somehow uh, having unrealistic expectations about the uh, importance and magnitude of ISMED uh, resources. I think we have to have a foot down approach in this regard. And nobody argues that uh, the region uh, contains enormous amount of reserves in gas and oil from uh, Gaza Marine all the way to southern Turkey. The issue is not a uh, below the ground issue is uh, above the ground factors that really determines how things will be going. And also the realistic expectations and projections show that this region will not have more than let's say 10 BCM of gas available for export by 2000, 
2025, whatever figures you could. And in the overall uh, framework of the things, this could never be a game changer in the global sense. It is an important development, but we overuse this cliche of game changer. And it is an important factor that should be always considered and uh, looked at. And if you look at the world uh, gas markets, there are really game-changing developments. Of course, U.S. shale gas, we are not going to discuss it here, is a real game-changer. Nobody can argue against that. If the U.S. Senate will allow the U.S. to export shale gas, this is going to dramatically transform the gas markets from which East Met gas will be also seriously affected. Russia is on the losing end of the new game-changing uh, developments we see. Its production seriously uh, declined over the past few years. It's also market share in Europe uh, and Turkey uh, being somehow reduced. And domestic uh, competition, Novatec, Independence, Rosneft, or all of them are changing the marketplace in a very dramatic way. Then you have new producers coming to the market. It's not only Ismet gas. Iran, last year was the, um, the elephant in the room, but now it's coming out. It's re-engaging, as you said. You will be also looking into Iran's re-engagement. As the country having the second largest reserves of natural gas in the world, it's not going to be easy, of course. I also this will not be rushing into Iran when the doors are open. But we expect that over the medium to long term, Iran will be a very important provider of gas, LNG, pipeline gas. Towards the markets that also Ismet gas will be uh, uh, targeting. Tanzania, Mozambique, Angola, Turkmenistan. It's still a miracle in, in, in the making. God knows when will happen. So much gas stranded there. And if it finds a way, again. So just to give the message that Ismet gas should be seen in the global context as one of the gas producing areas with lots of political, legal, and commercial issues. Commercial, the second point I want to make is that no matter what you say about the geopolitical realities, at the end of the day, who is going to put the money behind it? The investors are very, as you know, nervous about committing funds to new projects multiple new projects. Even Shakhtar's two projects took ages to come to fruition. So there are examples that we should look at. And therefore, the commercial realities should never be ignored. Yes, we can discuss the political drivers of each country. And Lebanon already started spending the money that they don't have. You know, they want to build all this uh, high-speed train and uh, all of a sudden huge wealth will be generated. So I think realism here is very important in this regard. And the other point I want to make is, of course, Turkey. And Turkey um, is a, a huge power as a consumer of energy, as an investor in energy in its own country, as well as surrounding regions, and also as a transit country. And energy is also Turkey's soft belly, because Turkey energy demand is around 6.5%, much more than its GDP growth. And it is going to grow even further, despite the difficulties that Turkey is going through right now, domestically, in politics and business life. If you wish, we can also discuss that, but I'm not going to touch on that myself. Turkey depends 98% in the imports of natural gas, which is used for almost half of its power generation. In oil, is almost 93%. So if you pull together all Turkey's gas resources and produce it, it will be sufficient to meet the demand only for, let's say, five or six months of Turkey's uh, consumption. But Turkey is not without options. This also has to be seen clearly. Russia is the biggest provider, followed by Azerbaijan now, Iran, almost 10 BCM of gas, bring it to Turkey, and KRG. I'm on the board of a company which produces the largest amount of oil and gas in Kurdistan. And then by 2017, if things go well, and Turkey will be buying its cheapest gas from that region up to uh, 4 BCM initially. By 2020, 10 BCM of gas will come from there. Iran would like to increase, double its uh, sell to Turkey. Turkmenistan one day might come, and you have Azerbaijan. Other fields, Afsharon, Umut, Nakhchivan fields, which will increase gas production. 
And in this context, East gas is also important, very important for Turkey in terms of diversifying its sources of supply, that's what you call energy security, in terms of lowering the price we pay, because the highest price we pay for gas comes from Iran, followed by uh, Russia, Azerbaijan, then Kyrgyzstan perhaps. So it has to compete price-wise with other providers. Then shale gas, of course, from US might change this as well. And yes, I agree uh, fully uh, with my colleague, Ambassador last Shek, minute. last minute, that uh, relations between Turkey and Israel is getting better. And, but domestic difficulties Erdogan has, and three elections coming up, of course, make sure that these negotiations are held more or less behind the scenes, not made so much public. And uh, secondly, in, on Cyprus issue, there is a sudden revival of interest and push, especially from Washington. So we can expect some positive results coming uh, in this direction. And so also a word of caution and prudence, as we know, Cyprus problem, so many people dealt with it, so many peace envoys, special envoys and initiatives, it hasn't got anywhere. And, uh, but personally, I'm optimistic that because of the win-win situation for Israel, Cyprus, Turkey, and also other countries in the region, there is a hope for uh, pushing this process forward. And as I said, work of this type will help a great deal to clear the way and also make the policymakers more realistic make them more down to earth rather than having unrealistic dreams or expectations. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both of you for time discipline and when you discussed uh, uh, and of course for, for competent statements within this time discipline. Um, when you discuss Cyprus we have a real expert here and that is Androula Kaminara. I welcome you here very much. Um, Andrula has been uh, four years between 2008 and 2012 uh, the head of the e European Commission representation in Cyprus. Uh, she is uh, currently the European Union Fellow at the European Studies Centre at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. And uh, she's a special advisor to the European Commission uh, with a, a long career within the Commission. <coughs> And uh, uh, Andrew, I have your resources. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize. There was a problem with the train, so I'll explain it my late arrival. In addressing the question that is posed by uh, the conference today, I broke it down into four separate questions, and then I tried to uh, address. A little bit closer to the mic. Yep. Thanks. Um, in order to address the, the major question that we're talking about today, I broke it down to four questions and I will try and give an answer to, um, to the question, Turkey and the med gas, what does it mean for Europe and the world? So in order to address that, we have to see what is Turkey's uh, energy landscape and where is it going? Where is Europe's energy policy and what we can expect next? What's happening globally in the world? And how does Turkey and, uh, and uh, the med gas and uh, Europe's policy fit in? Um, on the first question, what is the current energy landscape of Turkey and what are the forecasts? We've already heard some elements from the two previous speakers. One of the things that has to be underlined is the very high dependency of Turkey on imports on um, natural gas. Um, one other thing that has to be underlined in the current political context is Turkey's dependence on Russia for energy, not only for gas, but uh, recently there were some uh, agreements with Gazprom in order to um, build uh, three um, nuclear power stations, um, which basically would give uh, Russia almost a monopoly in that field for the next 15 or um, or so years. At the same time, if we look at uh, Turkey's energy landscape, we have to underline that uh, um, huge energy investments are, will have to be made over the next years. At the, uh, it's estimated six to eight billion dollars per year will have to be invested in order to upgrade Turkey's energy infrastructure, in order to allow it to be 
the energy hub it wishes and uh, aspires to be. And of course, a lot of uh, decisions will also have to be made with respect to uh, liberalization. Uh, and as already mentioned, this in the context of three upcoming elections may seem even more difficult than it would have seemed any anyway without, without the elections coming up. And as uh, a very good report, which I think another speaker here uh, has written, and I advise everybody to, to look at it. It's from the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies. Uh, Gulmira Rajeva has actually uh, drafted it. It's excellent. It underlines how Turkey may be coming up with uh, problems even uh, uh, supplying its own market in the next years. I think 2015, 2016 uh, period and 2021, 22 uh, may um, bring up um, particular problems for the Turkish market. So let's move on to Europe's energy strategy in general and uh, for the region. Central to EU energy policy are three themes. One is energy security through diversification. One of the problems that Europe uh, has is that uh, it relies heavily on very few uh, suppliers, one of them being uh, Russia, 34% of the EU market uh, on natural gas depends on Russian supplies. And in the, uh, I think we cannot uh, ignore what's happening uh, in, the, in the region with respect to energy supply to Europe. The elephant in the room, as far as I'm concerned, is what's happening in relations Russia-Ukraine right now and how that supplies to the um, uh, European market, and I would just quote from the statement of the heads of states uh, a few days ago on the 6th of March. Um, it was with respect to Ukraine, but it just gives an idea of where is Europe's thinking right now. So it says, energy and energy security are an important part of, union, of the Union's external relations. We will continue our efforts to ensure security of supply. We also call for the effective and consistent implementation of the third energy package by all players in the European energy market because uh, we're also trying to um, push for interconnection of the European market. Um, and it says the European Union will stand ready to assist Ukraine in securing its energy uh, supply through further diversification, enhanced energy efficiency, the effective interconnection with the European Union. And in fact, if one asks if Europe is to diversify, where is it going to find uh, the new energy from? Of course, there are a number of uh, ways. We have always been pushing for renewables. Shale gas is a possibility. It's very controversial. Huge differences of opinion exist between the member states. We're trying to regulate that. Medgas, of course, is near and potentially very interesting. It is not going to substitute the other, uh, let's say, uh, our dependency on, on uh, Russian gas, but it, it is important and cannot be ignored. And if we also consider Cyprus and potentially uh, findings in, in Greece, they are indigenous, they are European energy sources. So that has also a value if we put it in the mix of, um, of uh, how we consider European energy sources. So just to underline here, when Europe is trying, in fact, to diversify away from dependency of Russia, we cannot underline that Turkey is, is moving closer to relations with, uh, with uh, Russia and getting more dependent on Russian uh, uh, gas. Energy map of the world, uh, we've just had some member states addressing the US and asking for uh, uh, natural gas to be exported, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, and Slovakia. So since I was actually uh, introduced as somebody knowing about Cyprus, I spent the last minute on Cyprus, Cypriot um, <coughs> negotiations between the Turkish Cypriot and the uh, Greek Cypriot community started about a month ago, but this is highly controversial. In fact, today, um, the, all the um, cabinet ministers of the Cypriot Republic of government, the Republic of Cyprus government have handed in their resignation because there was the junior coalition party uh, left the government and the new government will be um, announced shortly. So 
the negotiations are ongoing. Yes, they have tried many times before. I think it, this time is in a totally different context, in a totally different Europe, in a totally different region. And uh, I will uh, end by uh, agreeing with the ambassador, Ambassador Sheik, who says that the, the economy will not help to overlook some of the political problems, but I think the economy may smooth the edges of some of the uh, political problems, and I, I end up with an optimistic uh, uh, view on what may happen next. Thank you. Well, we thank you very much. We, we hopefully hear, hear more of that during this, uh, this conference and later, and, uh, but I would like to, to stay for a while in, in that area and ask uh, Anthony Ivanios. Uh, for his comments. Anthony is the CEO of Energy Stream. Uh, he has uh, over 20 years of experience in structuring, negotiating, implementing oil and gas project. Uh, for example, as president of Poseidon, offshore natural gas Greek Italian pipeline. Uh, in that capacity, he achieved the agreement for the construction of the Greek Bulgarian natural gas pipeline, IGB with Bulgarian energy holding. Uh, great experience, uh, and it is a, well, you're based in Frankfurt, but, uh, well, you're Greek, and uh, you have your insights from your experience, please. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pfluger, for the invitation to address this distinguished audience. I start immediately with uh, my topic. Turkey and Mediterranean gas, what does it mean for Europe and the world? And I would like to give the dimension of the relationship of Turkey with the Southern Gas Corridor, which very much influence the behavior of Turkey in East Mediterranean uh, region. This is the Southern Gas Corridor. The Shah Deniz will produce 16 billion cubic meters, out of which 6 billion will stay in Turkey and 10 will go to Europe via the Trans-Anatolian pipeline crossing Turkey and then the Trans-Adriatic pipeline crossing Greece. This is a $45 billion investment, the largest gas investment of BP in the world, the largest gas investment of onshore pipelines in the world. Next one, please. So, the role of Turkey in the Southern Gas Corridor is the golden gate of Caspian gas. Turkey aspires to bring now Sudanese gas and Azerbaijani gas, and in the future, Turkmen gas or Iranian gas, as we heard before, or Iraqi gas. So this is the big picture for Turkey, and this is on the interest of Turkey. Next one, please. And if Turkey is the golden gate of gas, Greece is the silver gate of gas. Because the first entry point of Azerbaijani gas to the European Union will go via the Turkish-Greek border. Once the Azerbaijani gas is on Greece, it's on the European Union, and with the new gas infrastructure that Europe is building, this can be swapped into the rest of the European Union. Next one, please. So, the relationship between Greece and Turkey, it is key for the stability of energy security and for the strengthening of the European energy security. So, it is in the interest of Turkey to cooperate in Eastern Mediterranean. <coughs> because Eastern Mediterranean, and this was very well said from Mr. Uh, Mehmet Ögutsu, it's a smaller area. It's not going to have a big impact on the European energy security. So when we are talking about Caspian gas, Iranian gas, and Iraqi gas going via Turkey, this is the primary interest of Turkey. So it is in the interest of Turkey to cooperate and it is in the interest of Turkey to cooperate with Israel and Cyprus in particular. There is a very strong relationship between Israel and Turkey because every day Israel is importing quarter of a million barrels of oil via the Baku Tbilisi, via the Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline. And 
although that gas discoveries are not a game changer in Tamar, Leviathan, and Aphrodite, they are a geopolitical game changer for the East Mediterranean region. Next one, please. So what are the policy priorities for Turkey? First of all, Turkey should aim the development of the Southern Gas Corridor and demonstrating to the European Union and to the West that is a reliable transit country. So Turkey needs to cooperate both with Israel and with Cyprus and to implement an effective policy that will bring more Israeli and Cypriot gas to the European market and to the international market. And I think this is the biggest quote unquote bet for Turkey. Turkey should not jeopardize its role as a credible transit country for the European energy security by quote unquote playing small time power politics games in Eastern Mediterranean. It is much bigger for the interest of Turkey, for the stability of the European energy security, especially now with what we are experiencing with Ukraine for Turkey to play the stability role, it needs to cooperate with Israel and with Cyprus. Thank you. Well, thank you. Very, very clear, very powerful. <coughs> uh, I would like to turn to someone who just can tell us her view on, uh, on top, on what that uh, what we discuss here means uh, from her perspective coming from Azerbaijan. Uh, and I'm happy to say uh, Gulmira Jayeva has been here before uh, at the Institute speaking uh, on the BTC pipeline uh, a year ago or so. And uh, well, Gulmira, we, we are happy to have you. You're a senior research fellow at the Center for Strategic Studies under the president of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Your visiting research fellow, we just heard that at the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies, and a non resident scholar at Hazar Instituto Hazen, based in Istanbul. Uh, you have uh, published frequently, and we're, we're happy to have you here. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Pluger. Um, I'll, I'll go directly to the topic. Today, I would like to uh, focus on mainly on the infrastructure. Um, make a few points on how this gas from the uh, actual gas coming from new alternative sources uh, can be uh, delivered to the markets uh, and, and what is the uh, best economically viable way to transport this gas. Um, I would have to do a few points on that and my first point is that yes we know that Turkey, um, Turkey and uh, Greek Cyprus has uh, uh, to some standoff on uh, drilling issues at the uh, EEZ uh, in, in, in the sea, but and, and the, at the same time, Turkey and uh, Israel has some political, uh, actually experienced some political um, standoff uh, in the past. But um, I think that if Turkey uh, ensure that its interest um, uh, would be materialized within. Uh, those projects, either as a as a, a transit country or as a market, then um, the uh, economic or commercial interest of the country will pre prevail those over the uh, uh, the political uh, the uncertainties between uh, uh, the sides. And uh, this is this is because mainly the Turkish, uh, as we heard today, the Turkish gas demand is increasing. Uh, very, uh, dramatically, so um, uh, uh, as um, uh, uh, Andrula Kaminara mentioned uh, today, from uh, already starting from 2015 and 16, Turkey can experience the supply gap. Uh, this this is the time before the Chardonnay's gas, Chardonnay's uh, gas from s second uh, stage of development uh, will be transported to Turkey, and this is before the Iraqi gas can possibly uh, uh, transport it to Turkey. So uh, Turkish, Turkish government uh, has this concern uh, how to uh, meet the uh, growing uh, uh, gas demand. And uh, I think that, uh, if Turkey uh, ensures that uh, its commercial interest uh, will be materialized within this project, then uh, 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 
the political standoff would, uh, would be easily uh, solved. My second point is, um, what is the best way to deliver this gas uh, to the market? Uh, uh, is the LNG, uh, as of today, is the economically viable way to do that? Um, you know, uh, it seems that at the moment uh, uh, um, LNG is uh, is the more expensive uh, option in compare with the pipeline because uh, this is maybe the case with Cyprus and with uh, with Israel. It's uh, uh, less secure uh, to build LNG facilities uh, in the Israeli coastal Mediterranean uh, and. Uh, uh, LNG facilities today, to build LNG facilities would be more expensive with the, uh, some investment starting from, uh, f from uh, four, five, or six uh, billion US dollars, whereas in uh, pipeline infrastructure could be invested only two or three billion uh, US dollars to build a pipeline from, uh, um, from Cyprus to Turkey, even uh, underneath. Uh, Today in Europe, the price of LNG is going up, uh, but this is this is at the very moment because in the future it can be changed, of course, because more available LNG in the market from uh, different sources from uh, US, let's say, would of course affect the price. But as of today, the price stands very high. I think this is one of the reasons why uh, why the um, uh, LNG import in uh, in in Europe was uh, <coughs> decreased up to 50 percent. For example, Poland is struggling to uh, build these LNG facilities. To, to lessen its dependence on, on Russia. And uh, if Poland today were imported um, LNG from Qatar, then the price of Qatari LNG for Poland would be $600 per thousand cubic meter. So we all understand it's the way higher than um, importing uh, pipe gas. Um, so at the very uh, moment, the pipeline seems to be the best uh, commercially viable option to transport this additional value um, to the market, uh, I mean, to the um, uh, uh, Turkish market, or even from Turkey to the European market, with, uh, with as I said, two, three uh, billion um, US dollar investment in the infrastructure. And the, I think for uh, Istmet gas uh, at the first stage, the Turkish market would be the best. Uh, uh, again, commercially viable market because of the price. The price is, uh, is uh, quite um, average European price in the market. If you take the average uh, Turkish price, it's it's something like 340 uh, US dollars per thousand cubic meter. Uh, the cheapest price for Turkey is as 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 gas, and the most expensive price is the Iranian gas. Uh, so the average price is 340, which is the average European price, and I think this would be uh, one of the best uh, market for uh, for Ismet gas. Um, uh, having said that, the uh, question of in infrastructure uh, rise here, uh, whether the Botash, the existing Botash transmission system, is capable to transport this gas within the country and. Um, also to, to be able to transit this gas in the future to the uh, uh, neighboring countries, let's say to the European countries. Uh, uh, Botash transmission system is constrained, we all know that, especially the, diff uh, the problems exist on the uh, uh, east part of the country, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, sorry, in the uh, west, uh, uh, east part of the country. Uh, Turkey has been struggling to import um, the gas, the, all the contracted gas from Azerbaijan and the, from Iran, and for that, it, it pays a lot as a take or within the take or pay obligations. Uh, but the situation is a bit better on the uh, south and west part of the country, uh, where uh, if if uh, agreed, uh, would import gas from uh, uh, from East Med. But uh, 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 some investment is needed to upgrade this part of the transmission system as well. Uh, it's not a big investment uh, with small upgrade work or. Um, with the compressors, it would be possible to import some additional gas from uh, from uh, East Med, but uh, we should remember that uh, this would be, uh, again, limited volume of gas. Turkey will not be able to import with aggression, with compressors, um, 6, 7, or 10, 10 BCM of gas, uh, only probably uh, 2 or 3 one, BCM. One more 
yeah, two three BCM would be would be possible to import. So uh, and here uh, comes to the play the um, uh, standalone and dedicated pipeline that would be uh, would be uh, able to transport big volumes of gas. And as it seems that TANAP can do a rail, rail difference not only within the Turkish market, but also to transit this gas further to the European uh, markets. And my bottom line is uh, that, yes, the Southern Gas Corridor, as uh, we hear a lot uh, 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 with 10 BCM, cannot make a difference. On, it's not a game changer. However, if you combine all this gas coming from uh, these alternative sources, uh, from Iraq, Ismet, etc., in one uh, dedicated infrastructure such as TANAP and further uh, ATAP and the other infrastructure, then it can really make a difference in the market with 20, 30, even maybe more BCM of gas annually going to the European market. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you. And I now turn to uh, Julian Kifu, who is uh, advisor uh, to the Romanian president for strategic affairs and international security. He is also a professor at National School of Political and Administrative Studies in Bucharest and founding president of the Conflict Prevention, Prevention Center, a non-governmental organization in Bucharest. And he is uh, happy to say that a member of the advisory board of users from the first moment and the floor is yours, Julie. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first congratulate you for this uh, timely discussion. I think that uh, we are in due moment and allow me, that's why I basically left my, my office where I, I am dealing with the Ukrainian crisis to, to run to London for this meeting and I will begin with a conflict and end with a conflict. I would like to make five points. The first one is the important changes and shifts that we can see in the Black Sea by the last developments in Ukraine. Basically, uh, the Crimea uh, militarization can harm what we are calling the East-West Black Sea-Caspian Sea Corridor, linking the landlock and the highly rich uh, the region of Central Asia via the Southern Caucasus to Romania. A lot of projects have been made on the, on the table, transportation are uh, on the making, and in the current situation, this could be a threat, including to the type of denial of access that we've seen during the Russian-Georgian war in 2008. For sure, alternative is Turkey, and that's my second point, the importance of Turkey has been on the line already here, I will pass very quickly. The important, it is important also for the uh, East Mediterranean, since uh, from the point of view of the countries in the Black Sea and from uh, in Eastern Europe, LNG is not a solution. As you know, from uh, secu for security reasons, there's no possibility of take a tanker and, and transport it via the Bosphorus. So in that particular condition, the only type of use of LNG is via Croatia and, and more of a Central Europe, Western Balkans region. In that particular area, Turkey would help only if we, were, we are going to have an onshore uh, pipeline to link with those regions which are depending 100% on, on gas. My third point is about the relations. Relations are counting a lot. Turkey is very important, but its relations, we've already heard here, are quite ambiguous, let me put it that way. Turkey, Israel, there's a difficult and painful way to rebuild these relations. And I think that a common project uh, ideology, the way that we have had with the Stability Pact and Western Balkans, by using this, this Mediterranean project could help. Turkey and Cyprus, uh, so we have to go back for this relation to the Cyprus crisis. Economically, some steps forward have been made, but from the point of view of, of the political approach, we've already heard some ideas here. It's still far. Turkey and Greece, apparently it's, the be it's a better relation. There are steps forward, uh, hopefully, this type of, of, uh, of uh, system, of network of relation can be improved. My fourth point is about Romania, Romania and its added value. 
As you know, Romania has a strategic partnership with Turkey, has a strategic partnership with Azerbaijan. We are also developing two major projects in, in gas, shale gas by Chevron onshore and the offshore gas Exxon with some interesting quantities. It's not a game cha changer. We've heard here about game changers. It's not a game changer for this part of Europe, but in any case, it's there are quantities available for exportation in the countries all around, and it's an added value together with some other projects to uh, the rebalancing of the situation. And with this being said, let me arrive to my fifth point, which is about conflicts. How economic projects like this one, major economic projects, could uh, forge, could, could uh, help in the solutions to the conflicts. We have already passed through some of them, Turkey, Israel, I think that that with the political changes that will happen, we are going to see some light on these relations. Turkey and Cyprus, maybe this type of common projects to exploit some of the resources would help in improving even the, the formal frozen forgotten conflict in Cyprus. At the same time, even since nowadays we are looking at Ukraine, even in that particular case, this unique way of traveling gas via, from, from Russia via Ukraine could be unblocked at some respect and some flexibility could come with this for the solution of the existing crisis in Crimea and Ukraine. Thank you very much. I hope that I'm in the time frame. Absolutely, you are. Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Uh, I would like it now uh, to turn again to Israel and to uh, uh, Dr. Amit Moore, uh, who is an energy economist, energy strategist, uh, financial analyst, and he's the CEO and owner of Eco Energy in Israel, an advisor to the government of Israel, and uh, someone who, uh, who is uh, advice and who is uh, inside especially when it comes to energy issues in the Mediterranean is, uh, is uh, of great importance and therefore we are happy that you came to London uh, directly from, from uh, Israel. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fluger, for inviting, uh, inviting me to this important uh, event. Um, first, um, Israel and for some degree also Cyprus um, are uh, blessed with a major uh, uh, resources of gas. In fact, the two largest gas deposits in uh, finding in the world that took place in Leviathan, 20 TCF, 19 in fact, and 10 TCF at Amar field in the past five years. And already uh, in domestic utilization, Israel is breaking a world record in shifting power sector to gas from zero 10 years ago. Already now 55% of the power is generated from gas. And uh, in the five years time, uh, about 70% most of the industry already utilizing gas, and uh, more and more, and the vision uh, of an entrepreneurial country uh, is to shift more than 50% of the vehicle fleet of the country to natural gas-based technologies in uh, about 15 years' time. Compressed natural gas, production of methanol for methane, natural gas, uh, even uh, um, plug-in electric cars to 70% of the power is generated uh, from gas to charge batteries. So this is a feasible issue uh, to lower our addiction uh, on oil. So this is a, a national vision, and I think it is doable and will be implemented. Now, and rightly said, um, there are about 500 BCMs, billion cubic meters of gas, with current reserves that can be exported. And... Uh, prepare this slide here uh, to show what are the options of exporting uh, East Mediterranean gas. And I'll start with the most economic to the least ones. All of them are difficult, but as I did about uh, two decades ago, I wrote my PhD dissertation on natural gas in the developing world and empirical evaluation of obstacle merits and risks, analyzing more than 200 natural gas projects and um, export projects are uh, complicated. For uh, example, the, the top project took about 15 years to materialize and still about five years until the gas will start, or 10, year, 10 BCM a year, to flow from Azerbaijan 
to Europe is just one example. So first, the first export project already signed several weeks ago, small amounts of gas from Israel to the Palestinian Authority for power generation. This is uh, not uh, significant quantities, uh, but it's going to be supply half of the, uh, of the uh, um, amount, the consumption of the Palestinian Authority in terms of uh, power production. It's very important also politically uh, to the region. The second one is export of about 3 BCM a year uh, of natural gas from Israel to Jordan. And here, um, about two weeks ago, first project was announced some uh, relatively small uh, amounts of gas exporting Israeli gas to the Dead Sea Works, the Jordanian Dead Sea Works, the potash factory in Jordan, just 15 years extension of a pipeline, 15 kilometers, uh, that can be done very uh, relatively quickly. The most economic uh, major term export project from Israel is pipelines, as strange as it can be, from the Leviathan field to an idle LNG project in Egypt. And there is ongoing negotiation between British Gas, BG, ENI, and FENOSA, which own two major LNG plants on the Mediterranean in, in Egypt. One of the plants is working 30% capacity of BG, and one of the plants of ENI and FENOSA is sitting idle because of shortage of gas in Egypt. Now, a direct connection from the Leviathan field to those two projects is being negotiated. This is the most, ex uh, most uh, economic export project, but here again the political risk is high. Although the gas is not going to be used, to used domestically in the Egyptian market, but just for liquefaction by those plants for export to European and Asian markets. And those uh, companies, three European, leading European oil and gas companies, are in a major dispute with the Egyptian government. They don't get the gas they have to receive according to the contract they have. And this is an option which is uh, negotiated, but uh, of course with the political risk. And we have to take uh, into major consideration and learn the lesson of the gas which stopped to, uh, which, which flowed from Egypt to Israel from 2008 to 2011 and stopped flowing since then, since the political risk is high. Then comes the third option, that's export of a, a 8 to 10 BCM a year, about $3 billion project, a pipeline from Leviathan field to uh, Chehan or Iskaderun area in Turkey. Um, um, negotiation is taking place, the major commercial will, the project make economic sense of, uh, from both the uh, suppliers and uh, several Turkish companies which are more than willing to take all of that quantity for domestic use. Um, um, of course, the project, the problem here is political in nature, because as long as um, such a project should have the umbrella uh, of a bilateral uh, agreement between the governments, as long as the Turkish-Israeli bilateral relations are not uh, uh, resolved, and as long as at least Mr. Ardoan again and again, and last week uh, again, is um, conditioning the upgrading of the Israeli-Turkish uh, bilateral relations with the upgrading of the Israeli-Palestinian uh, relations, especially the uh, siege of the closure on, on Gaza. So um, this is a non-going uh, option, uh, condition. A major upgrading in the bilateral relations is needed uh, to have this project uh, going ahead. Because otherwise, there, there is a deadlock. What we learned um, in my studies, many other studies already stated here, in this respect, geopolitics comes before economics. And as long as there is a, a geopolitical barriers, um, such project cannot uh, materialize. Although it makes so much economic sense put into this uh, um, hindering factor the Turkish uh, Cypriot problem, because of course the Cypriot uh, approval, approval should be granted for such a pipeline to go via a Cypriot EZ. So this is also already complicated. And then the options, which I think is very viable, is, uh, these are LNG options. The most uh, um, 
um, I think uh, possible of which is FLNG, floating LNG. There are already two projects <coughs> under major uh, um, planning of Tamara FLNG and especially the Leviathan FLNG. Um, the, these are, this is a new technology, but here geopolitics is almost not involved. It's purely in the hand of the suppliers to develop those projects. Both of the Cypriot side for Aphrodita, because Aphrodite field is a rel relatively small deposit. Uh, they can uh, possibly export about uh, 4 BCM per year, very suitable for Cyprus. And for Israel, two or three such projects uh, can go together. And the, FLNG, uh, the LNG project in Vasilikos, of course, we need a combination of Israeli gas and Cypriot gas. <laughs> and and uh, I think um, there is still uh, time to, to develop um, this project. But we are no looking now from a purely uh, static point of view. We should look at the issue of developing East Mediterranean gas from a long-term point of view. It, it took about 25, 30 years to develop um, export of North Sea gas, of uh, developing the, 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 the Gulf of Mexico uh, gas, especially to, to the, the continent of the USA and so on. And I'm very confident that the next decade, any and uh, Total and uh, um, Nobel Energy and other companies will find more gas uh, Eastern Mediterranean, offshore Israel, offshore Cyprus. Hopefully, much more gas will be found also offshore Lebanon in the uh, coming years. So in the long term, I hopefully um, they're going to be uh, um, upgrading of the bilateral relations between Israel and Turkey, Israel, Turkey and Cyprus, and Israeli and Eastern Mediterranean gas, hopefully also Lebanese gas, gas could go via Turkey to the Turkish domestic market and to, uh, also to the European market. Uh, at the first stage, to the region, if geopolitically feasible, and if LNG, so the market is especially in the Far East, China, 16 LNG, the gasification terminals are under construction, India, and some degree, some gas to Europe. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amit, for, for your plédoyer for LNG. And I know that the next speaker will uh, probably repudiate that, uh, John Roberts. Well, I, I would like to introduce the last two speakers together because one is already uh, institution as a writer on energy, uh, John Roberts, and the other will soon be an institution, uh, that is Aura Sabados. We yeah. have two great journalists and writers uh, who are uh, extremely knowledgeable about those issues. Uh, John has been a, a journalist who has been producing breaking news and who has been everywhere in the energy field where, where something happened, writer for Platts, and uh, uh, well, Aura is, uh, is one of the greatest experts on Turkey. Uh, she is, uh, an, uh, has her MA from King's, is doing her PhD here, and we're proud to have her as a research associate at users. You will have the last word, uh, Laura, that is on purpose, uh, and first, John, uh, fighting LNG option. I understand. Thank you, very much. Uh, my thanks, obviously, to you, Kirst, to ISD, and to Conrad Adnan Stiftung for inviting me. Um, I have no thanks at all to give to Ambassador Sheck. I wrote a 10,000 word paper and he summarized it accurately in two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> This is humiliating. Um, there was a reference to the elephant in the room. I can think that there are a couple of elephants that haven't been mentioned. The first one that I was thinking of is East Africa. The rise of East African gas means, I think in practice, with the delays that we are seeing at Leviathan, we are not going to see gas from the East Mediterranean go to the Asia Pacific market. It's going to go to Europe. That's the first element, elephant. 
We do know, I think, that Woodside, now that it's coming in to the Leviathan project, is looking at floating LNG. That's a change. Doesn't mean that there won't be a pipeline, but it means that their pipeline has to compete much more strongly than before with floating LNG. But there are other elephants. Indeed, I'm not quite sure how many elephants you can get into a room. We've heard the mention of Iran. What if Iran does come on stream for the first time with significant quantities of surplus gas available for export, possibly as early as 2015? Secondly, Turkey itself. Algeria, declining gas exports rapidly down 10 BCM or for something last year. Collapse of export levels to, Egypt, to Italy and not likely to renew its LNG contracts to Turkey this year. Does Turkey face a gas problem much earlier than we think? Third elephant in the room, Russia. Four if you want to count Ukraine as an elephant in its own right. Why do I say Russia? Because we have predicated so much of our energy security on the concept of partnership. How can you have a partnership where one side considers force to be a routine aspect of policy and the other essentially regards it as something to be avoided at almost all costs? In essence, Partnership implies win-win solutions. We do not see that approach from a Russia that increasingly seems to go back to the concept of zero sum. Why does this have a fallout for Turkey? Well, I think it has a fallout for two reasons. The first is a practical one. What is likely to be the EU's response to what's going on concerning energy and doubts about reliance on Russia for energy security? First of all, a much tougher approach to Russian onshore pipelines, South Street. The Russians have already said that they understand they will have to submit South Stream to European Commission assessments to see if they can secure exemptions. Not if, they expect to secure them, and they will. But that will take time. And there's always been a hidden premise that while there would be an important connection between South Stream offshore and the major onshore section to go to the European Union, oh, and just by the way, we do not know where that European Union section is actually going to end up. Gazprom has changed its mind again. There is also the other connection that needs to be made, the connection down to Turkey, the connection to the existing Russian system or Gazprom system that comes down through Romania and Bulgaria to Turkey. That too has to be connected up and that too requires EU approval since Bulgaria is a member of the European Union. And one last giant elephant, the biggest one of all. We operate in a wonderful world in which politicians go around saying, what we want is something very simple. We want cheap gas. <coughs> there is no such thing as cheap gas. The Ukrainians were going to get cheap gas, 20% discount. But there was a political price to be paid for that 20% discount, and they are paying it right now. Turkey, Turkish officials talk of cheap gas, and they specifically talk of cheap gas coming from northern Iraq. Yes, they could probably get it below the price of others, because northern Iraq would be dependent on them. But there would be the political price to be paid. And that political price could well be 
having in effect to extend Turkey's security umbrella to northern Iraq. And then we come back to the Eastern Mediterranean. Commercially, and of course we acknowledge you have to have a commercial underpinning for all these relationships. There is a wonderful market in the whole of south of Turkey for gas from the Eastern Mediterranean. It's an absolute natural. But to do that, you need a settlement over Cyprus. Most people would think that that was a price well worth paying, indeed to be encouraged. It, you do have to bear in mind the possibility that from a Turkish perspective, this might be considered a loss of face. That's a price Turkey might have to bear in order to get cheap gas. But lastly, if one can get East Mediterranean gas to Turkey, what are the consequences for the Southern Corridor as a whole? I think the Southern Corridor has become ever more important as a result of the Ukraine crisis. If you can get gas from the Eastern Mediterranean to Southern Turkey, it is possible, particularly if you also get it from Northern Iraq, that existing flows of Azerbaijani gas, the 6 BCM that goes from Shakhtanese phase one, may no longer be required within Turkey by the time the contract is renewed or up for renewal in 2020. In other words, as well as flowing 10 BCM of Shakhtanese phase two gas through the whole TANAP system to TAP and to Europe, you could add an existing 5 or 6 BCM from Shaftanis Phase 1. That would remarkably improve the economics of Tana, which are very, very poor. <coughs> so all of these things are interconnected, and maybe that's the really big thing we have to bear in mind. If we don't look at them in an interconnected fashion, we're likely to see what is happening <coughs> being repeated all over again, bilateral agreements with Russia, dependence on Russia, and a large number of very powerful European states rolling over when we see Russian annexation of physical territory close to, though not adjoining, the European Union. All right. Thank you so much, and also for, for addressing uh, the question of uh, of uh, Hans Hartwig Blomeyer uh, about the impact of the Ukrainian crisis that we just see. Uh, all right. Well, being the last, I, I almost feel like having to sum up in a way, but I have additional details to bring here. So the question is, Turkey and Mediterranean gas, what does it mean for Europe and the world? Judged from a purely geological perspective, I would say not much, as the previous speakers have said. Eastern Mediterranean Basin is thought to hold 3.4 trillion cubic meters of gas, roughly 1% of Iran's total reserves. Israel's 680 BCM would represent roughly 0.4% of the world's total, compared to Iran's 18%, Russia 17.6%, Qatar's 13.4%. If Israel's reserves are small, Cyprus's Aphrodite is even smaller, around 145 BCM. Judged from a political perspective, however, we get an altogether different narrative. The argument that is frequently mooted is that the pipeline to Turkey from Israel and Cyprus is not only commercially viable, but also politically advantageous, as it would enmesh these three countries with a history of animosities into a web of cooperation and mutual support. The problem with peace pipelines, however, is that they may not be as peaceful as they sound. The much vaunted Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline may have brought Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey into a closer partnership, but speak to analysts, and they will tell you how unhappy Turkey is about the transit fees that it collects from the transit of oil. Moreover, the Baku Tbilisi 
Erzurum pipeline, which, carry up, which can carry up to 6.6 .6 BCM of gas from Azerbaijan to Turkey, does have the mysterious tendency of seeing gas curtailments, particularly at a time when Turkey and Azerbaijan negotiate the price of gas. Both Turkey and Azerbaijan deny any reports that these curtailments have political undertones. But as a, as a journalist, I see these things happening. Besides, if we were to judge matters purely from the peace factor, a pipeline that would fit the bill is the Arab gas pipeline. Thanks to the existing El Arish Ashkelon spur, Israel could not only reverse flows and start exporting gas to Egypt, the country in great need of the fuel, but also feed volumes through the main line traveling to the Jordanian port of Aqaba and then north through Lebanon and Syria and head to Turkey. En route, it would collect Cypriot, Lebanese, and Syrian gas through the two spurs linking Tripoli and Banias in Lebanon and Syria, respectively, before heading to Turkey. Such a pipeline would most certainly accommodate the political vision of regional peace, helping to put an end to what one may arguably call a, conf a, a, a biblical conflict between Jews and Arabs. But if the commercial factor were to inform the decision-making process, then of course the LNG option is by far the more attractive one, thanks to the prospect of selling volumes to East Asia. Compared to the price that Israel may sell into Turkey, reportedly at $360 per thousand cubic meters, East Asian prices are by far more competitive at $600 per thousand cubic meters. Yes, the costs may be high. A one-train LNG facility at Vasilikos in Cyprus, for, for example, may cost $9 billion, but any additional trains would cost another $3 billion and would make such a project feasible. It has been argued that Cyprus alone does not have enough gas to make the LNG option viable. However, if Vasilikos were to become a hub, it could ramp up exports, expected to be around 7 BCM by 2020 to 35 BCM in 2025 and to 50 BCM in the long term if it were to collect Israeli, Cypriot and Lebanese gas. Israel has also been considering a floating LNG option and has an agreement with Daewoo of South Korea for the development of such a project. Moreover, Daewoo has already signed a letter of intent with Russia's Gazprom, which is interested in receiving volumes for, from the proposed plant. But such an option comes under serious security doubts. If we saw that the security fears related to the discharge of LNG tankers delivering for the Israeli Electric Corporation at the um, floating storage and regasification unit. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that satellite trackers never revealed the position of these vessels approaching the Israeli coast precisely for this region. Then you can imagine the security fears related to a floating LNG terminal, which is expected to have the size of four aircraft carriers and is vulnerable to even rocket-propelled grenades. Moreover, the LNG option is under serious doubt. The passage of Israeli LNG through the, through the Suez Canal heading to, to the Far East should happen freely under international law. The change in government in Cairo should have helped to warm up relationships between Israel and Egypt. But as analysts have pointed out, there is always the poss possibility that Egypt may stage politically motivated inspections on spurious environmental grounds that may block or delay the passage of these vessels. The other LNG alternative, developing an LNG terminal at Eilat or Aqaba that would bypass the Suez, may not be seen favorably by Israel as well as Saudi Arabia or Qatar. That then leaves us with the Turkish option and the implication of an emerging relationship between this country, Israel uh, and Cyprus for the region and the world. We have seen that as far as Israel and Cyprus are concerned, neither the Arab pipeline as a peace project nor an LNG option as a commercial project are um, viable would tick the re required boxes, prompting both to look at the third option, which is exports to Turkey. A 470-kilometer pipeline linking Israel's Leviathan to Turkey appears to have greater chances of success, especially if Cyprus were to be convinced of the attraction of selling gas north and opening its waters to this pipeline. But what is the attraction for Turkey itself, a country that expects to import 6 BCM from Azerbaijan, at least 10 BCM from northern Iraq, and possibly crank up volumes from Iran? Its consumption is tipped to increase, but in fact, last year it dipped by 0.5 BCM to 46.5, and its economy is growing, although at a more moderate pace. Why would one 
Why, one would ask, would Turkey need more gas when it could source volumes at some of the cheapest prices anywhere in the world, and that is from northern Iraq? In fact, Turkey could import gas from northern Iraq at $280 per thousand cubic meters. Very, very cheap. There are two overwhelmingly important reasons. Firstly, a stronger Turkish-Israeli relationship underpinned by physical infrastructure, i.e. a pipeline, would help to guarantee greater stability in the Middle East. Such a relationship is highly important to the United States at a time when it feels constrained to look more to East Asia amid fears of China emerging as a military power. It is therefore in the interest of the United States to delegate some powers to Turkey and Israel with whom it has an exceptional close relationship to ensure that regional stability. Secondly, a strong Turkish-Israeli relationship could also counter Russia in Europe's eastern flank, as well as the resurgence of Russian power in the Middle East, as recently seen in Syria. However, in order to challenge Russia's grip over Eastern European countries, where it continues to remain the main supplier of gas, Turkey will have to reform its market entirely to ensure that the flow of natural gas responds to the logic of demand and supply, rather than to political diktats. It is important to stress here that Turkey, thanks to its size, proximity to three quarters of the world's conventional hydrocarbon reserves, and growing population is the only country in the region capable of establishing a gas hub that could challenge Moscow's most powerful weapon, and that is the oil indexation. The fact is well understood by Turkey's private gas sector, and as I am told, and I'm happy to break news to you here today, that Turkey will include an NBP linkage in the, in the sale of gas uh, from Israel. In fact, over the next few days, you will see an announcement from uh, several Turkish companies um, for the launch of a consortium that takes the obligation, the responsibility, to sell gas from Israel into Turkey. The liberalization of the Turkish gas market is therefore of vital importance, not just to Turkey, but also to producers such as Israel and Cyprus, which need reliable markets impervious to political volatility. In order to ensure that liberalization, the EU has an absolute obligation to open the energy chapter for Turkey. And countries such as Cyprus and France, which have or may block such an action, should understand now in the 11th hour that it is in the interest of everyone to reach that goal. The emergence of more gas supplies, be they Romanian, Azerbaijani, Iraqi, Israeli, Cypriot or Iranian, should be celebrated in the region. However, the events of recent weeks have shown that Russian gas is, in the words of the Marx and Spencer ad, not just any gas. It is gas with strings attached to it. And few realize that under the Kharkiv Agreement of 2010 and subsequently the agreement of 17 December 2013, Ukraine extended the lease for the use of the military base of Sevastopol and relinquished to the Russian Navy the Kerch Peninsula on the Crimea in exchange for cheap gas. Therefore, a liberalized Turkish gas market enjoying diversity of supply as well as flexible pricing would be the only one capable of challenging Russia's show of power in the region um, and also establish a, a more stable climate. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Aura. It was a little bit more than six minutes, but that was because of the breaking news, and therefore... Uh, thank you. <laughs> and now, of course, uh, extremely interesting. And Well, if, if you allow me a, a, a few comments and, and the attempt to, to uh, bring it together with one experience which, which was very basic for my understanding of... Uh, the East-West conflict at that time. That was the German uh, deal with Russia in the early 70s, uh, gas for pipes. Uh, that was a long-term deal. Uh, Germany built the pipes, uh, got the gas from Russia in long-term contracts. Uh, that was a stable, reliable <coughs> partnership that was and is uh, stable and reliable partners. Uh, it survived all the changes in, in the Soviet Union and Russia. It survived all the changes in Germany from conservative governments to social democratic governments. Why? Because there was an overwhelming economic rationale. Uh, 
Germany needed badly the gas, reliable gas supplies for its chemical industry, for, for the whole industry, uh, uh, industrial sector, and Russia, which uh, sends even today 70% of its gas to the European <coughs> Union, needed a reliable um, uh, consumer for its gas. So this was the overwhelming economic rationale. Uh, let me warn everybody who says here so strongly, well, we have new options now. Great that we have TAP and East Met gas and uh, Iraqi Kurdistan gas and shale from the US uh, probably being exported faster than uh, we anticipated because of that, uh, that development that, that in, in Ukraine. Those are great options, but options for basically the end of this decade and the next decade. For the time being, we do not have that option. We have a Russian dominance, not only concerning Germany, but against Europe, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe. And, uh, and that dominance will grow until the end of that. Uh, decay. It will grow because uh, indigenous uh, uh, gas production in Europe will go down. So whatever options we have, they will only reach their full potential after 20. And therefore, I think with all the muscle flexing and what we want to do against Russia and doing sanctions, we should be a little bit more cautious and and look to the realities, the realities uh, uh, that we are facing today do not give us much leeway. Russia is not just a single state, it's a world economy, uh, a raw material giant, and I think we have to consider, I'm, I'm not saying that anything is legitimate what the Russians do in the Kremlin, but I say we, we should have uh, and, and I'm not, I have not uh, moral ambiguity to, to those things that happen. But we should, as for, if we formulate foreign policy, look a little bit to interests and not uh, uh, believe we are stronger than we are actually than we actually are. But that is just a, a, a small remark. Let me make one more remark coming from this Russian-German experience and the pipeline. This pipeline that we have, uh, and also Nord Stream, and, and, uh, has an enormous geopolitical meaning. It has an enormous stabilizing meaning for a region. In my point of view, the Cold War would not have overcome without that pipeline and without the confidence it created. And imagine a pipeline between Israel and Turkey. What it would mean to the region. Both players would have an enormous interest from the very first day of, its, uh, of the signature of the contract, that it will work, and it can only work if they have peace. We heard, and I think this was also, for me it was a breaking news, I'm sorry, perhaps I, I, I lost it. Palestine uh, no. uses Israeli gas. Well, this shows the enormous potential that we have here. So, uh, uh, Cypriot question. Perhaps in a way, in the Middle East, a uh, problem. And Turkey, Israel, all that is at stake. And here we have a great chance. And we should, for God's sake, use that chance. And I'm grateful to what uh, Anthony said when he summed up and said, I hope that Turkey is so strong and so clever to understand that it can be a, become a great player, uh, really change European history if it does not entangle in the old traditional regional conflicts and believe it can make a lot of points there. And that, that would be a wonderful situation and, and because we want to, to argue for that, we want to continue this debate not only here. Do not feel irritated by this, we have time enough. Um, the floor is open to you. Please. <laughs> Oh, my name if you is just Gary. could exactly, if you just could uh, uh, briefly introduce yourself so that everybody knows you, and, and stand up would be very nice. My name is Gareth Winrow, an independent analyst. Um, we've heard lots of talk today about the importance of TANAP, 
trans anatolian gas pipeline and how it could take, as well as Azerbaijani gas, gas from East Mediterranean, gas from Turkmenistan, gas from Northern Iraq, through Turkey to Europe. And we've heard a lot of talk about the importance of Turkey. I'm wondering whether we should really stress more the importance of Azerbaijan, in that it has majority ownership of TANAP, and that it will give priority for its gas, as we've seen from Shaktenis too, and from Apsheron and other Azerbaijani gas fields in the future. Azerbaijani gas will have priority going through TANAP, so it looks like it's going to be 20 years or so maybe before we see Turkmen gas, Kurdish gas, East Med gas, if ever, going through Turkey to Europe by TANAP. Thank you. With, with the light. Adnan Watanser from King's College, uh, Russia Institute. Uh, well, I have one quick comment and uh, one question. Now, the comment is, uh, I think there is pretty much a consensus about the important role that Turkey can play uh, in what we are discussing here, especially in terms of European security. Uh, now, what's, what would be interesting to, to discuss probably is also, there have been a lot of uh, things that have been going on in the past three months, especially in Turkey, uh, which uh, lead to different uh, speculations or scenarios about potential political instability or uh, increasing political isolation of the current government if it remains in power. I mean, a lot of people comparing the current leader with, with Putin. It's not really a good place, to, a good person to be compared if you're talking about energy security. Uh, so this is a question which is, I think, is quite significant to be part of the discussion when we are talking about this. And I hope that this question will be resolved in the best way so that uh, it actually contributes to European energy security. My, my point, my, my question, my specific question is about the uh, energy economics of East Met Gas. Uh, as uh, John Roberts mentioned, uh, energy economics for, uh, for the Southern Corridor, it barely made it actually, thanks to uh, quite significant sacrifice on part of Turkey, because Turkey could have potentially uh, got all of the gas from there instead of getting more gas from Russia, or at least much more significant amounts, but it did make a sacrifice uh, to get much less than, uh, than it wanted and uh, to transit the remaining one. Now, the question is, uh, how does the economics of East Met gas compare if it reaches the same market in Eastern Europe? Uh, starting with upstream, do we know anything about its relative cost compared to East Met gas? Uh, I mean, East Met gas compared to Caspian gas, or compared to, uh, to Russian gas? Also? Thank you. Thank you, Adnan. Please here. This gentleman. Thank you. Uh, Slav Miloszewski, I'm with the uh, uh, Center for International Minerals and uh, Energy Law. Um, th thank you so much, so much for your presentations. Now, the geopolitics of energy uh, in the wider Black Sea Caspian region have been debated for over a decade now. Um, what has changed is uh, uh, the, the political developments post the Arab Spring. Uh, most recently, uh, the Iranian case, and now the production of gas in Israel. Now, uh, what hasn't changed is the strategic role of Turkey uh, in this equation, and the energy demand. Um, Turkey uh, uh, plans to become one uh, of the 10th biggest economies by 2023. And uh, according to the recent statistical data, uh, the demand in energy will grow from what was in 2011 uh, from two, uh, 114 um, million tons of oil equivalent to 218 million tons of oil equivalent. Uh, so taking into account, I'm just wondering whether you would comment what is the long-term energy policy of Ankara uh, to address this pressing uh, issues and whether there is any chance to breach the interest of the European Union, the energy markets, and more state-centric perspective on energy in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Not yet, then I'm John. There's an awful lot of stuff there, and a little bit is in the slides that I didn't show you. and. Uh, but you can certainly take them home with you or get them circulated by Kings on, on the data of what gas is available. The first thing is about gas going through Azerbaijan as opposed to coming from Azerbaijan. There will be the original 10 BCM of Shaftanese 2 and 6 for Turkey. 
and then we don't know. The earliest Absheron is likely to come on stream, and Gormira will know more about this than me, seems to be about 2025. There may be some smaller amounts from fields like humid before then, but nothing major. What is interesting is that the Turkmens again, only a couple of weeks ago, raised the question in talks with Turkey about gas coming through Azerbaijan and through Tanak to the Turkish market. Is this likely? No, but it should be. No, because I think it's extraordinarily difficult ever to imagine the Turkmen's getting their act together sufficiently to create the conditions under which foreign investors will put their money behind a Trans-Caspian pipeline. It's doable. It's technically doable. It's politically doable. The question is, is it commercially doable given the way the Turkmen's behave? That's the big question. But if they got their act together, then there is a very good window for them around 2017. The developers of TANAP, the developers of the entire Southern Corridor say, in effect, if we get notice in 2017 that the Turkmen's want to put gas in, we can plug the one gap that there is in the system, which would be the necessity for an expansion costing around something like $2 billion of the line through Georgia to accommodate Turkmen gas. In effect, the line from the Azerbaijan border with Georgia to Turkey and the start of Tampa, which at the moment is only being configured to carry Shaftini's phase two gas and nothing else. So, if they had that, they reckon they could do it, it's technically doable, and you could immediately put in something like 10 or 12, shall we say, one eight or nine BCM Trans-Caspian pipeline string. There would be space for that, and it would improve the economics of TANA no end. There is a school of thought in SOCAR that favors it, whether it's politically acceptable, that's a different question. The future of Erdogan in Turkey. Gosh, do we have, how many elephants do we have in the room? Um, there isn't an answer, because we do not know how much of Turkey's current energy policy could be described as the settled will of Turkey, as opposed to Erdogan's latest lurch one direction or another. It makes sense to have an energy entente with Israel and to make peace with Cyprus en route. That should benefit Turkey as a whole. But is this bound up with Erdogan himself? Could well be. The same goes for anything to do with the Kurds. In other words, we've reached the stage where I don't think Erdogan is a Putin, but he has the same kind of centrality in the Turkish political system that means if he were to be removed, we really have very little understanding what would come afterwards. So in that sense, yes, it's central. Uh, relative cost of upstream gas, anything in the Mediterranean, ought to be cheaper than anything produced offshore in Azerbaijan because essentially they're both technically difficult. The next phase of Azerbaijan, which is beyond Shaktanis too, so-called deep level Shaktanis or Absheron, are going to be very technically complicated projects, just as Leviathan is going to be a technical complicated project which means, to my mind, I don't know what they will cost in terms of production costs, but Leviathan is at least on Turkey's doorstep, so therefore the transit costs will be cheaper. Thank you. For sure. We have first Mehmet and then uh, Anton. Uh, I will slightly challenge you with regard to Russia's dominance. Nobody doubts that it is the 
uh, world's uh, natural gas superpower right now, but in a few years' time it will be challenged by the U.S. And also, I think dependence is not one-way street there. Russia depends equally uh, on European Union and Turkey, second largest um, client uh, of Gazprom in natural gas. Therefore, I think there is a right balance of interest there. And if Russia is allowed to uh, upset this balance, of course, if Europe is not responding in the same way that Russia will understand, this is going to create an imbalance there. But we should always bear in mind that Russia doesn't always have the upper hand. There is a mutual uh, balance of interest that should be harnessed by the European uh, political machinery as well, not only believing that Russia can get away with whatever it is doing right now. And price-wise, um, Ismet gas, I think, will be close to um, KRG gas pricing, our calculations show, not cheaper, slightly higher, but it is compatible with, because unless this gas price of uh, Ismet, Ismet Terrain Resources will be not comparable to KRG gas or Azeri gas or in between, I don't think it will be attractive, commercially speaking, for Turkey. Cheap gas, yes, has a political price to pay, but all countries are now uh, trying to get as affordable gas as possible, given the fact that, especially in the US, you know, the European Union countries, uh, on average, is paying three times more than the US for gas. This is creating very serious competitiveness problems for EU. The other issue that was mentioned is about Turkey's uh, long-term energy uh, strategy, what it is. And uh, it's quite clear from Turkey's perspective, they want to reduce the share of natural gas. Currently in the energy mix, it's around 43, 44%. It used to be 52. And they want to bring it to manageable levels of 34, 35%, if possible, by 2023. But still, the demand for natural gas will go up. And we are predicting something like 80, 90 BCM of gas still be needed in, in Turkey mainly for power generation. And also, the other issue that we have to highlight here is that Turkey becoming a credible transit country. I don't think that there's any question on that. Turks uh, understand the importance of this issue. However, Turks also doesn't want to be just a transit country because they are a major consumer of gas, about 46 million cubic meters of gas per year. And when all this gas flows through <coughs> Turkey, the idea of regional hub that has been mentioned, although Turkey doesn't have the prerequisite for regional hub right now because we have to have the right physical infrastructure, legal institutional framework, and political willingness not to play, uh, to pay, play with gas as a, a political instrument. But the eventual goal is to become also a regional hub. That means uh, developing some win-win propositions, creating some added value for Turkish uh, interest as well, if we are talking about real partnership. Because Turks are not happy with this country to be used, just crisscrossing pipelines, which brings heavy uh, prices in terms of geopolitics, environment, and other issues. It has to be worthwhile for Turkey to serve as a transit country. But this is part of the picture. Transit, the other issue is also regional uh, hub. Long term, uh, yes, uh, I agree. Especially in the energy industry, we always talk about long lead times for investments. 15, 20 years for North, the North Sea uh, resources to develop. But I think uh, the international climate has changed now. Things are happening at a quicker pace. Who could have imagined that the US would be one of the major exporters of natural gas while companies were building LNG receiving terminals 10 years ago? So with technology, geopolitical developments, market developments, I think things will now move faster. Therefore. There is a window of opportunity for Ismet gas to be harnessed and uh, uh, mobilized. And uh, it's very good that Israel now is uh, selling part of it to Palestine Authority, power generation, Jordan. There are so many options. Basilikos, Greek, Greece pipeline, Akabe, and uh, Egypt. This is also a critical issue because there's a pipeline already which has been bombed, I don't know how many times, by the Egyptians. So it could be reversed from there and use the BG and BP facilities there, and the uh, WFSU. So there is a potential there, but you can't have too many options. I think one has to focus on some clear, deliverable options so that we can focus our political and uh, business energies on that, rather than trying to spread ourselves thinly on too many uh, options we can put on the drawing board.
Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And then Daniel. Uh, there was the question uh, where will Turkey get its oil and gas? Uh, the answer is by normalizing its relations with its neighbors. Commerciality with its neighbors can lead to the to feed, to fulfill the future uh, gas demand of Turkey. There are three tangible gas fields right now, Tamar, Leviathan, and Aphrodite. So these are three tangible options. There was a point mentioned about Turkey sacrificing by giving 10 billion cubic meters to the European Union and keeping only six from the Southern Gas Corridor. And I would like to challenge that and to continue the thought of uh, Mehmet uh, Egutsu. Turkey seeks to become an energy hub. You become an energy hub when you cooperate. And TANAP pipeline, which is $10 billion, and I'm looking at uh, Gulmira Razagiva because there is six billion plus put from Azerbaijan, only two million, two billion dollars will be put from uh, uh, Turkish companies and there is the question of BP, how much money BP will, will put. So when we talk about gas, we should understand the business model and the business reality. Gas requires infrastructure, it's not like oil. You discover oil, you put it on a tanker, you throw it into the international markets. And gas infrastructure requires cooperation, requires intergovernmental agreements. So for Turkey to reach its goal as a hub, as a regional hub, it needs immediately to improve its relations with its neighbors. Thank you. Um, since I was the first speaker and I sort of introduced the dilemma that uh, diplomats often observe between uh, uh, rational uh, business thinking and uh, more complex emotional, uh, ideological, political thinking, I must say that uh, the, the, the really fascinating discussion that uh, came afterwards of the issue uh, showed it in a very simple manner how, how true that, that is. Because, uh, for example, Dr. Amit Mo, in a very uh, simple and professional way, what he was saying is, let's just liquefy the stuff and sell it far away, just get rid of it as far away from here as possible and, not, and just leave me alone with all these uh, geopolitical uh, problems. And he's right. From a, from a purely practical point of view, that is the rational thing to do. But I must say, um, that when I said that this is a game changer, obviously it's not a game changer for the world, but it is and should be considered a game changer on a regional and local uh, scale. And that is by far good enough for me. But this is a national resource and it can, it should not, maybe it's naive what I'm saying, but it should not be measured purely by uh, business considerations. And that is why, in our discussions in the ISD, think tanks are made for this also, to propose bold, uh, not necessarily obvious solutions to things that go a little bit beyond uh, the, 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 the practicalities. So, I personally think that there is something very inspiring in the thought that natural gas, which is beginning to be a shared resource, a resource that exists in off Many, off the shores of many of our countries, can become a sort of cement, a sort of uh, basis for helping this area of the world start performing and behaving like a region. This is a world of regions, and as regions we will be able to prosper and to survive. And this is a real opportunity. And I think if it is worth pushing forward these ideas, even if they seem difficult from a geopolitical point of view. Thank you. I have uh, Andrula Ora Gulmera. Okay. Um, for me, one of the things that is, is, is very important to underline is that there's these spheres of interest and uh, influence, which are currently, there's a struggle to redefine, both in the Mediterranean region, but also globally. So in that context, what we're looking at the region is how we should see. The second one is our issue of timing. 
the importance of East Met gas will not uh, be maintained, you know, if we look at it again in 10 years' time. It's important to have some decisions now. So timing is, is very important, and also for the countries in the region, and as we've seen also for Turkey, it has to take some decisions now in order to meet its own um, uh, demands and also to play a role in the, in the future. And uh, the previous speaker said that uh, about the important strategic role of, of Turkey and its economic advancement. Absolutely no doubt that there were amazing economic advancements. But it's slowing down. It has, certain, it has political problems to solve. It has to transform internally. That's why we're seeing all these political problems in the future. And in a way, it has to decide with who to be. One of the struggles, in one of the debates currently, I think also in the, politically in Turkey, is which, uh, which uh, continent are we going to go uh, closer to more Europe and uh, or uh, try and be a player on, on, on their own. Uh, again, Russia-Turkey uh, trade balance, I think it's about 38, 40 billion Euro, uh, dollars per year. Six are exports from Turkey to Russia. 30 something, 32, 33 is imports from Turkey on energy from Russia, so the balance. And diversification is the buzzword. I think when we've mentioned and uh, we've discussed Cyprus, it, it has been with respect to all of its energy, uh, could potentially supply Turkey, potentially do this, potentially do that. If we look at everybody else in the region, what they're doing, Israel. It's not putting all its eggs in one basket. Turkey doesn't want, the EU doesn't want, and no other country is, is, is looking at it that way. So we should not forget that element too. And I finish with uh, the fact that I think, uh, particularly in the current economic uh, crisis that Cyprus is undergoing, I think they would love to have a solution. <coughs> Finally, something which I think is an anomaly uh, uh, should be sort of resolved for everybody's, everybody's good. Right. Regarding prices, I don't have upstream prices, but I, I already quoted some figures. Um, the cheapest price into Turkey would be $280 per thousand cubic meters from northern Iran. That's the absolute cheapest. The next one, if Israeli gas were to come to Turkey, it would be $360 per thousand cubic meters. The next one up is Azerbaijan, and I think Turkey already buys at $380 per thousand cubic meters. Private importers in Turkey buy around $305 after a discount that Russia granted to uh, these importers. But it's worth remembering that most of these importers have already connections with Gazprom. Bertaj buys at $406 approximately, and the most expensive one is Iran, 570, and Iran in fact said today that it would not reduce the price. So you can see, but the problem is not these prices that are sold to Turkey, the problems are the subsidies inside Turkey and the, the, the whole, we've seen with Ukraine, Ukra Ukrainian subsidies represented 7.5% of the Ukrainian GDP, it was Achilles heel. It was absolutely disastrous. If Turkey doesn't scrap the subsidies, it will. I would not want to, to predict the same gloomy future. But remember that Turkey is a transit country itself, just like Ukraine. And just like Ukraine, it has a subsidy system. So that has to go immediately. Secondly, you asked about the, what has happened in Turkey over the last three months. and how that could impact the, uh, the whole energy dynamics. Um, well, it's very well to have a very fatalistic view and to say that everything is in the hands of Mr. Erdogan. And I have lots of friends, and I think Turks have a wonderful sense of humor when they say that uh, the price of gas is, is Erdogan indexed. Um, I, I, I witnessed a really interesting development when Mr. Erdogan at some point said that there will be no raise in interest rates. Um, it was in Turkey's interest to keep interest rates low. Well, it didn't happen because the international pressures were much stronger. And at that point, Mr. Erdogan had to back down. 
maybe the same thing will happen here in this particular relationship. Maybe he will see the, the need for that security between Turkey, Israel, Turkey, Cyprus, Turkey, Iraq, and so forth. And yes, American prices will be $10 per MMBTU. You do, your, you do the conversions, please. Thank you. Good Mega. Yeah, and the first question about Azerbaijan and uh, Tanap with Azerbaijan, I would be interested in uh, transporting gas coming from uh, some other alternative sources. Uh, well, uh, first of all, the Trans-Caspian uh, pipeline um, has not been built, uh, not because Azerbaijan doesn't want it to be built, but uh, because of some other uh, problems with the uh, 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 Turkmenistan that demands to um, uh, to include in the um, uh, agreements the uh, uh, third party in the face of EU to sign as a, uh, a guarantee of the uh, uh, fulfillment of the obligations of the sites as uh, the, the price guarantee, the transportation guarantee, etc., which is impossible because uh, um, EU is not a uh, is not a um, uh, company or a single country to uh, uh, to uh, have a party to the contract. It doesn't have this uh, mandate. Um, uh, so there is a political obstacle, as we all know, uh, as Russia opposed the pipeline, etc. So this is not because the uh, uh, not because Azerbaijan. Uh, is not uh, uh, offering its uh, territory as a transit country. I mean, it has been s repeatedly said that we are ready to uh, to be a transit country to transport this gas to the uh, west westward. Uh, as for the TANAP, uh, of course, Azerbaijan uh, would be interested to have as many players as possible uh, uh, in the project and to generate uh, interest of as many players uh, in the region uh, and to have as much volume as possible to transport via this uh, pipeline because it would uh, uh, make the pipeline even more strategically important. As I said, this uh, uh, more volumes to this standalone infrastructure would uh, mean would increase its importance in the in the market. And uh, Azerbaijan is the owner, state oil company of Azerbaijan, as the owner of uh, this infrastructure. Of course, will have some not only commercial assets or benefits, but also political uh, benefits from these. Uh, to, to, to turning this infrastructure to a, uh, in, to a uh, very uh, strategically important one. Um, as per the uh, Turkey's, what is the uh, was question on the um, uh, cheap gas coming fr uh, from Iraq or the uh, sources for uh, Turkey? Well, uh, Aura named the figure said that uh, can be the cheapest, two hundred and eighty. Dollar Iraqi gas. My question is, why do you think that the companies that are investing huge amount of money in upstream projects in Iraq would be uh, 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 would agree to uh, sell uh, their gas for this uh, cheap price? Uh, I, I doubt so because uh, just one fact that would uh, support this argument. I was talking to the. Um, Representative of OMV, OMV who uh, uh, has uh, its investment in Iraq and developing uh, the f uh, upstream project in Iraq, and they said that they have discovered uh, the field. Uh, they are they they invested in the field. They are ready to start developing the field to start drilling. Uh, 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 drilling works, etc. But they will not do that because the price is too low to to start, you know, further works uh, to, to to develop the fuel and start uh, transporting this gas to Turkey. So uh, I think the IOCs will wait until the price will will be at least the average uh, European price to start exporting this gas to to Turkey or to other other markets. So uh, we have to think about the interest of IOCs as well in that sense. And the uh, policies of uh, Ankara in uh, 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 growing, actually, the, uh, as I said, the uh, 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 Turkish government has this uh, concern of the grow growing demand. And uh, according to Botaj, by 2036, the gas demand in Turkey will reach, uh, will be doubled and reach 80, something like more than 80 BCM uh, per annum. Uh, but I think uh, this is 
a bit optimistic. Uh, I, I don't see that the gas price, I, I mean, I, I'm saying according to the findings of the research that con was conducted at the Oxford Institute uh, for Energy Studies, and uh, I think it will not um, uh, uh, be more than 70 BCM per annum by 2036, but still, uh, now the main driver and all the policies that are, uh, uh, have been realized by the Turkish government to decrease this uh, share of gas in power generation and other uh, and industries uh, is the main driver is price. If price will be uh, a lawyer for uh, Turkey, then Turkey will just, uh, you know, will not go further in, uh, in uh, 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 initiating all these pr uh, 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 projects to decrease the um, uh, share of gas as it did in 2010, it started actually all these uh, initiatives to decrease the um, share of gas in, in 2010 when, when Russia increased its gas price for Turkey and, it was, and, and, and LNG price was also extremely high. Um, so Azeri, yeah, uh, and Azeri gas price is a bit lower than uh, was said. It's uh, up to two, three hundred and fifty dollars. So um, I think that the main driver for all the Turkish uh, policies in that uh, in that sense will depend will, will be price and will depend really on price. Thank you. And last word by Amit Moore. Thank you. Two uh, short comments. Uh, first, regarding uh, prices. Um, development of East Mediterranean gas, as long as uh, Kurdish gas, uh, for this respect, is relatively low, I think that the cost, not the price, of bringing East Mediterranean gas to the Turkish border, Jehan, East Mediterranean, uh, Southeast Turkey, uh, Skanderun uh, area, is less than $2 per million BTU, um, which is much less than, uh, um, than uh, Azeri gas, or not to speak on uh, Russian gas. Nevertheless, the price, and here nobody should expect that Israeli gas, and in this respect also uh, Kurdish gas, it's, not, it's going to be very competitive, not much less than Russian gas to uh, Turkey. In this respect, once Turkey has several suppliers of gas, eventually the price is going to converge. And in this respect, uh, there are no uh, cheap uh, purchases. The, the price is going to be competitive. We're talking about a period of five, six, seven years uh, from now. Now, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the likelihood of development of this project, just to, to summarize, many times the commercial uh, timetable is uh, not coincides with the, uh, the political timetable. As long as we are not going to see a major political will to uh, enhance and to develop this project, this project of Eastern Mediterranean gas is not going to be developed. And uh, unfortunately, as it is, that's reality, that's the lessons that we learned from uh, the history of the past uh, century of developing uh, export gas uh, projects. And at this stage, I still don't see the major will, political will, in both parties, I'm talking, uh, uh, on, on, on a change, I don't think that uh, for the Turkish government, the, car the current Turkish government, the East Mediterranean gas is the major uh, uh, is a game changer in changing its political uh, decisions. And there are other political cons considerations with the visibility relation with Israel and uh, with Cyprus. If this is going to change, for uh, thus uh, therefore the. Uh, the fact that the commercial parties in Turkey and the exporters and the importers on both sides are presenting to policymakers the benefits of this project, it can only facilitate. But the political will should be, uh, and that's the most important thing. Well, thank you so much, Amit. Uh, we will uh, see each other again in Jerusalem. Uh, we have a date in mind, 15th and 16th of September. That is. Uh, preliminary, not confirmed, but uh, well, everybody here who wants to come to Jerusalem and who hasn't been there, you should go. It's a great city and a great place and we have great subjects to discuss. I thank everybody of you here in the panel and especially in the audience this time because to have 11 speakers here is for an audience uh, quite a task, but this was possible because of enormous time discipline, 
And I don't know if I'm completely wrong, but my uh, lessons always were you can most, well, almost always say whatever you have to say in five or seven minutes. Uh, that is possible, and, and you show that it is possible. You, you focus clearly, we had a lot of very clear statements, strong statements, and I hope that, uh, that you share that opinion. Thank you very, very much, and please join us for the next workshop of users. Thank you.